Bless you, Marty. But do we have to take our cue from Brazil? We've seen collective action work before to make this a better country. Some of us have even been around long enough to remember the fight for voting rights 50 years ago. We remember the protests by courageous men and women who put their lives on the line and the political skills of President Lyndon Johnson and the Congress that passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I worked for LBJ and I was there when not long after peaceful protesters in Selma, Alabama had been ruthlessly beaten by white thugs in official uniforms. The president went before a joint session of Congress and turned the anthem of the civil rights movement into a hymn of freedom for all. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. The Voting Rights Act passed the Senate by a bipartisan vote of 77 to 19. Yes, 77 to 19. But even so, many conservatives opposed it then and have tried ever since to nullify it. Late last month, they succeeded. The Supreme Court's five conservative justices declared the key provision of the act outdated. Nine states, with a pattern of denying minorities the right to vote, most of them former members of the Confederacy, no longer have to get federal approval to change their voting procedures in any way. Several of those states immediately set out to implement restrictive new voting laws that before the ruling would have been found discriminatory. By coincidence, the very weekend before the Supreme Court's decision disemboweled that historic legislation, I had finished reading a masterful new account of the events leading up to its passage. This is it, Bending Toward Justice, the Voting Rights Act and the Transformation of American Democracy. You will not find in one volume a more compelling story of the heroic men and women who struggle for the right to vote, or a more cinematic rendering of the political battle to enact the law, or a more succinct telling of the long campaign to subvert it. The author is with me now. Gary May is a professor of history at the University of Delaware and winner of the Alan Nevins Prize from the Society of American Historians. Welcome. Thank you very much. What were you thinking as the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act? I thought first of the people you mentioned, the, uh, the, the people who've been forgotten by history, who for decades uh, had been risking everything, their, their homes, their jobs, and, and their lives. And I thought, here are these five men uh, men of privilege, men who'd served as U.S. attorneys, uh, judges, um, Thomas, uh, administrator. Um, how could they possibly understand the world of those men and women who fought and died for the Voting Rights Act? They don't seem to understand it at all. They think it's all past. By coincidence, I had just recently seen C.T. Vivian. He was one of Martin Luther King's top aides leading those demonstrators trying to uh, vote in Selma mm -hmm. when the infamous sheriff, Jim Clark, mm -hmm. wouldn't let them pass. Here's the scene. You are breaking the injunction by not allowing these people to come inside this courthouse and wait. Well, this courthouse does not belong to Sheriff Clark. This courthouse belongs to the people of Dallas County, and these are the people of Dallas County, and they have come to register. And you know this within your own heart, Sheriff Clark. You are not as evil a man as you act. You know in your heart what is right. What you're really trying to do is intimidate these people and by making them stand in the raid, keep them from registering to vote. And this, this is a kind of violation of the Constitution, the violation of the court order, the violation of decent citizenship. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. 
You can turn your back now and you can keep the club in your hand, but you cannot beat down justice. And we will register to vote because as citizens of these United States, we have the right to do it. I'm looking down the line, seeing all the people who've been in jail for felonies. That's what I'm looking Precisely at. Precisely right. And if, they, and if they're not fit to vote, you'll be able to find that out. But you'll not know it until they're, until they're on the registrar. And many of those have a felony action because Sheriff Clark made them a felony action, not because they were rightfully issued. <laughs> That was an extraordinarily important moment. A few nights later, Reverend Vivian was asked to uh, preach at a church in Marion, Alabama, not too far from Selma. And um, he did that, and the Parishioners were going to march on the jail afterwards, where one of their colleagues had been un unfairly imprisoned. Um, Reverend Vivian left. He didn't join that march. And what happened was that uh, the prisoners came outside, the demonstrators came outside to face uh, a, almost a mob of uh, Alabama police, local uh, police. Jim Clark was there as well. And uh, in, in the melee that followed, a young civil rights leader named Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed by an Alabama state trooper while he was trying to protect his mother and grandfather from um, a beating. And it's thought that Clark and the others were there to get Vivian for that encounter that they had. And of course, the, the Marion people were so distraught over Jimmy Lee Jackson's death that, that uh, one of them said, Let's take his coffin and, and to George Wallace in, in Montgomery, put it on the Capitol steps. And from that came the idea of this march from Selma to Montgomery. And so there was a debate in, in King's Circle. Um, should they go forward, uh, they might uh, encounter again what, what had been uh, encountered in, in Marion. And uh, King, King's advisors were divided. Some said, yes, let's go forward. King himself was uncertain. As you know and write about, President Johnson didn't want that march to happen either. Now, of course, he changed his mind later, and when Lyndon Johnson changed his mind, he came out the cross of a charging bear and a crafty fox. But at the moment, he was doing what he could to prevent that march from happening. Mm -hmm. Which is another irony, isn't it? Because here is the event uh, that almost never took place. And the event that Lyndon Johnson wanted stopped, the event that Martin Luther King uh, initially had uh, opposed, um, and of course, it turns everything around. And as you know, it came to be called Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. Here's that scene. To be detrimental to your safety, to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly, you are to disperse, you are ordered to disperse, go home or go to your church. This march will not continue. Troopers here advance toward the group. See that they disperse. so terrible. Uh, one person, we heard a person calling for a uh, doctor. Someone called for uh, an ambulance uh, to Sheriff Clark, and Sheriff Clark replied, let the buzzards eat them. Uh, and again, what was so extraordinary was that it was captured on film, and that proved to be absolutely critical. Journalists, print journalists, and uh, uh, photographers were there. They got their cameramen. They got the film back to New York very quickly. 
And ABC was the first to break the news by interrupting the movie of the week, which, uh, and again, an, an amazing coincidence, was Judgment Nuremberg, the 1961 film about the Nazi war trials. And people were stunned. They, they just watched the footage. There was no narration. Uh, and they, was this America? I mean, they, they couldn't believe it. They dropped everything uh, to join King's campaign. Others besieged Lyndon Johnson oh, yeah. in the White House, sat in, uh, in, in a group of them in the White House. What do you, what do these unanticipated, unexpected, unintended consequences of the convergence of such forces, what do they tell you about history, how it gets made? That it's primarily an accident. Uh, sometimes we see this story as, as one of Martin Luther King and Lyndon Johnson. They get together and we have the Voting Rights Act. But of course, it's a much larger story. And it's a, it's a perfect example of the value of collective change to bring about uh, uh, progress in, in this country. People getting together um, and being committed and willing to risk their very lives uh, to bring something that the country desperately needs it. But it's clear to me that if there hadn't been this steady witness and martyrdom of these young men and women in the South and a progressive president, the result wouldn't have been the same. If you'd not had the pressure from below and if you'd had a conservative uh, president, history wouldn't have come the way it has come to us. Yes. And, and once Johnson decided that that bill was going to go to the Congress, he was going to give that great address. He felt liberated. I was standing off to the right below the president on the floor of the House, and I could look right into the eyes of senators and, and representatives as clearly as I can look and as closely as I can look into your eyes. I mean, they had never heard a president of the United States say that anywhere. And to say it on the dais and the rostrum there in the House chamber before the assembled Congress, I mean, at first they could not believe what they had heard. Every device of which human ingenuity is capable has been used to deny this right. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that today is wrong or the hour is late or the official in charge is absent. And if he persists, and if he manages to present himself to the registrar, he may be disqualified because he did not spell out his middle name, or because he abbreviated a word on the application. And if he manages to fill out an application, he is given a test. The registrar is the sole judge of whether he passes this test. He may be asked to recite the entire Constitution or explain the most complex provisions of state law. And even a college degree cannot be used to prove that he can read and write. For the fact is, that the only way to pass these barriers is to show a white skin. No law that we now have on the books, and I have helped to put three of them there, can't... <laughs> can ensure the right to vote when local officials are determined to deny it. The speech written by my colleague, gifted young man, 33 at the time, I believe, Richard Goodwin. Goodwin and, and Johnson created a magnificent moment there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was almost an accident also. Uh, the first draft of that speech had gone to another Johnson aide. And Johnson said, you gave it to a public relations guy? I wanted Goodwin <laughs> to do this. I, I wanted a Jew to write this, this speech, someone who had, had experienced uh, anti-Semitism. Um, and while Goodwin was working on the speech, Johnson telephoned him and, and said, remember the story about how I, I was a teacher at that, that uh, Mexican-American school? 
And uh, of course, Goodwin had heard it a thousand times, and, and uh, John says, I, I want that in the speech. My first job after college was as a teacher in Cotula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. And they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them, but they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965. It never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over this country. You say that the Voting Rights Act never would have existed without the help of two generations of courageous Republican legislators. I agree with that because I worked with many of them when I was a young man on working on policy for President Johnson. One of them was Senator Everett Dirksen of Illinois, the Wizard of Ooze, <laughs> as you remind us. Uh, they had a, a, a very interesting relationship. Uh, you know, very often uh, Dirksen would attack the president on, on the floor of the Senate uh, in the morning, and in the afternoon they'd be drinking bourbon and, and branch water together. I mean, the, the, the Voting Rights Act was literally written in Everett Dirksen's office with the Attorney General, the Acting Attorney General and Katzenbach there. And, and some called the bill Dirksenbach. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and, and Johnson, of course, was, was quite content to give the credit for some of this to uh, Everett Dirksen um, because he feared that the Southerners might mount a filibuster as they had with the 1964 Civil Rights Act, long filibuster, and in order to get the votes to invoke cloture, which would stop the filibuster, you needed Republican votes. I, uh, the president sent me in 1964 to see Dirksen. He sent a lot of people up to see Dirksen. And I was 30 years old, and he was 68, 67, 68. And we talked about cloture very briefly, and then I said thank you. And I got up to leave, and I got to the door, and he said in that deep voice of his, Mr. Moyers, uh, yes. What about that great American I recommended to the president who belongs by destiny on the Interstate Commerce Commission? <laughs> I said, I didn't know you'd done that. He said, you just check it out. He's a great American. And he got on the Interstate Commerce Commission. I have to tell you that. I mean, that's the way they both understood politics. Yes. Unfortunately, we don't have that today. So Justice Roberts, when he writes uh, his opinion on the recent gutting of the Voting Rights Act, says, we don't need it anymore. He said, the country has changed. This is the age of Obama. We've got our first black president. And Justice Roberts even mentioned Bloody Sunday in Selma and the murder of those three young people, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner near Philadelphia, Mississippi. And Roberts wrote, today, both of those towns, Selma and Philadelphia, Mississippi, are governed by African-American mayors. Problems remain in those states, the justice said, but there's no denying that due to the Voting Rights Act, our nation has made great strides. We have made great strides. What's your reaction? We certainly have made great strides, but all we have to do is look at the voter suppression movement that arose from many of the covered states, incidentally, in 2011 and states, 2012. States covered by the Voting Rights Act. Correct. Voter IDs that are very difficult for uh, many African Americans and whites as well, uh, who are elderly and don't have those documents. Uh, it, it costs money to acquire these necessary documents. It's really a, a kind of poll tax now. Um, voter IDs make it more difficult for people to vote. Um, prohibiting voting on Sunday, which was so important to the African American community. They go to church, they go to the polls, it was taking your soul to the polls. Um, and all of those indicate a continuing need for the Voting Rights Act. 
What did the Supreme Court decision actually do? Well, by, by striking down Section 4, which contains the formula that allows Section 5 to cover uh, certain states in the South and nine, actually nine states uh, and, and parts of six uh, other states, requiring them before changing any voting practice to submit those changes to a federal court in Washington, D.C., or the Justice Department to receive what is called preclearance. And the reason the Voting Rights Act singled out those states is because for decades the voting rights of black people had been denied by one technique after another, as President Johnson said in his speech. And within hours of the Supreme Court's decision, the Attorney General of Texas announced that they were going to resurrect their voting ID bill, which mm -hmm. had been disallowed uh, last year. And there's an outfit Lewis Manan mentions in the New Yorker magazine. There's a white group in Beaumont, Texas, just waiting for this Supreme Court decision because they want to overthrow the black majority that runs the school board. So you're saying, I think you're saying, a lot of mischief can be done now that would have been disqualified by the voting rights provision. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, Chief Justice Warren, when he first when the court first ruled on the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act in 1966, said that the bill had been designed to eliminate the most egregious of difficulties, um, but it was also written to cover subtle devices. And here, I think, is an example of, of subtle and, and quite uh, harmful devices. We're still very polarized racially. Um, Sometimes it's wrong just to focus on the fact that we have so many uh, African Americans in office, in, in, including uh, a president. In the oral arguments, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said, you know, well, as you're saying that Alabama is more prejudiced than Massachusetts. Um, and the evidence indicates that, yes, it, it still is. The, the majority on the court struck down the provision that requires the states to get federal approval before making changes. Is there a historical record to suggest that this decision, in no small part, was motivated by a political goal? It's hard to say. Uh, to be fair, should we accept that maybe those five justices have their own set of political principles? Um, and we just don't agree with them. Um, you know, as a historian, you want to be fair. Um, but it seems to me that they are on the wrong side of history, that there was so much evidence to indicate continuing difficulties that to simply blankly say, we don't need the Voting Rights Act anymore. You know, we're in a post-racial society now. We have a black president. Uh, it is so uh, out of touch with what is happening in the country. Pardon me for suggesting that John Roberts sometimes seems less concerned with the law and the Constitution than with a political agenda. Is that unfair? No, it's not unfair. In fact, when he was a young um, member of the uh, Civil Rights Division uh, under Ronald Reagan, uh, he was at that point working very hard when the Voting Rights Act came up for reauthorization in 1982 to gut it at that point. So in many ways, the court's recent decision is the fulfillment of, of uh, Judge Roberts' dream. In fact, there's a memo that John Roberts wrote back then in which he said that parts of the Voting Rights Act would, quote, provide a basis for the most intrusive interference imaginable by federal courts into state and local processes. In other words, Uncle Sam, you're meddling too much. Let's move, let's get your hands off of the state processes. You know, it certainly consisted with, with Ronald Reagan's uh, philosophy of, of you know, um, government is not the solution, it's the problem. So we just remove government from regulating corporations and banks and everything will be fine. Uh, so that was the civil rights version of, uh, of Reaganism. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote in her dissent, quote, hubris, pride, is a fit word for today's demolition of the Voting Rights Act. Was it hubris? It, it's politics, and I think it's also ideological hubris, because 
if you go back to the, the, the critical documents that supposedly protect the right to vote, um, you know, the 15th Amendment passed in 1870 uh, declares that people could not be prohibited from voting because of race, color, and condition of previous servitude, and added, the Congress shall enforce this amendment with appropriate legislation. The first line of the 1965 Voting Rights Act says, this, this is a, a bill to enforce the 15th Amendment. So this was a power given to the Congress, not to the courts. The Roberts Court, in effect, said to Congress, you can rewrite these standards. You can rewrite the Voting Rights Act, and it's your obligation to do so. Any chance that this Congress would do that? It, it seems almost impossible because the Republican Party has become the party of the South and in a strange way has, be, has taken on the, uh, uh, the, the appearance of the old white Southern segregationist Democrats. Now you have analysts and others saying, the court's recent decision is going to actually help the Democrats in the voting booth and that it's actually going to be a spur to the energies of the Democratic Party in the coming elections. Do you see any possibility of that? Um, I don't know because I remember what was the decisive moment that turned this whole thing around that led to the creation of the Voting Rights Act. It was the tragedy of Bloody Sunday. I am I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the future. Uh, I think the court's decision does give a green light to all sorts of things, not simply the mischievous uh, devices to suppress the vote. Uh, but I mean, imagine the Supreme Court of the United States giving its uh, uh, endorsement of um, creating difficulties for voting. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary. And what comes of that, I don't know. You've written a book that could change this country again if every citizen read it. Congratulations. Thank you. On Bending Toward Justice, the Voting Rights Act, and the Transformation of American Democracy. And thank you, Gary May, for being with me. Thank you so much.